Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Becker. I'm Deputy Director of Cancer and Careers, and I want to thank you all for joining today's webinar. For those of you listening in from your phone, please let us know by sending an email to cancerandcareers at cew.org with your name and the phone number you're dialing in from. That way we can confirm your attendance and make sure you receive all the relevant follow-up after the webinar. Next slide, please. If you're new to Cancer and Careers, we are a national nonprofit and the only program of its kind solely dedicated to empowering and educating people with cancer to thrive in their work environment. This is a list of all of the free programs and services we offer. Our comprehensive website, available in both English and Spanish, is at the heart of everything we do. There you can find various support services, including our resume review service and access to career coaches. Our educational blog and newsfeed are both rich resources where those who have been diagnosed, their caregivers, employers, and healthcare professionals can stay current on topics related to working cancer. Our free publication library, available in both English and Spanish, provides tangible, easy to digest information on working and looking for work after a cancer diagnosis in both hard copy and PDF formats. We also offer a number of events each year from hour long webinars like this one to full day events. And I'll be back to tell you more about those at the end of today's presentation. For those of you seeking continuing education credit, this slide lists all of, the, uh, all of the organizations who have accredited today's webinar, as well as the required steps for getting a certificate. This information is also available on our website. A link to the evaluation and post-test will be shared at the conclusion of the webinar, so please take the time to complete them at that point. If you're unable to complete those today, a follow-up email with links will be sent tomorrow, Thursday, September 12th by 5 p.m. Eastern. Also, for those of you planning to request continuing education credits, our accrediting bodies require us to share this slide and let you know that there are no conflicts of interest to report. Now, as you might know, Zoom has a lot of great features you can use to interact with us today and as well uh, with other attendees as well. If you have any questions about today's content, please submit them by clicking the Q&A box below. We know the importance of privacy, so there's the option to submit your questions anonymously, and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions, but please be patient. If we don't get your question today, you can email it to us at cancerandcareers at cew.org and we will work on getting you an answer as soon as possible. In your features panel, you'll also see a chat box. Feel free to use the chat to communicate with our speaker, myself, as well as under other attendees. However, an important thing to note is that the chat box is not private and it will show your first and last name. So that is something to be mindful of if or when you decide to engage in the chats. Please do not put Q&A questions into the chat box as we may miss it. All Q&A should go into the Q&A box. Please also note that today's presentation is copyrighted. Therefore, the use of AI assistance and or transcribing or recording devices of any kind by attendees is not allowed. Those found to be using AI or other recording or transcription software during CAC programming will be removed from the event. They may be permitted to return uh, without, uh, without AI recording or transcription software. Real-time closed captioning is available for today's event for those who need it, and a captioned recording of this webinar will be archived on our website following the session. To request an additional reasonable accommodation, please send an email to cancerandcareers at cew.org at least 24 hours before live sessions. Thanks in part to support from Genentech and P&G Beauty, Cancer and Careers is proud to offer this 10th year of the Balancing Work and Cancer webinar series, which was created to provide anyone whose life has been touched by cancer with concise, targeted information about the work-related issues that arise after a diagnosis. 
Additionally, we'd like to recognize Cancer and Careers year-round sponsors who support all our core programs and allow us to continue providing all resources and services free of charge. Following a cancer diagnosis, challenges around navigating the workplace, expressing your needs, and managing side effects due to treatment are common. A strong and clear communication strategy can make a big difference to guide you along. To guide you along. Um, to introduce us to this topic today, I'd like to bring up Nicole Jarvis. Nicole is a licensed social worker who has been with Cancer and Careers for almost nine years. Prior to joining CAC, she spent four years at Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as uh, practicing social work in the area of child welfare. Following Nicole's presentation, there will be time for a Q&A, so feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Nicole. Thank you so much, Rachel, and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I know it can be tough to join a webinar at night, but uh, I hope that you'll be able to take a lot away from this evening's uh, presentation. So um, this is the second of two sessions that we've presented this fall on communicating effectively. Uh, if you missed that last session, don't worry. Uh, you'll still be able to follow along with today's session and hopefully walk away with some information that you'll be able to use in your daily life. Um, if you wanna go back and watch that first session, we do have it archived on our website and it can be a good refresher as well. So today in this session, we're going to be doing a brief overview of some of what was discussed last time in terms of what effective communication actually is. And then we're gonna shift into exploring where the rubber meets the road, to, so to speak. So we're gonna talk about best practices for using social media and other online platforms to really create a, uh, effective online brand. Uh, we're going to discuss tips and techniques for having conversations at work and when you're looking for a new job. And we'll also spend some time looking at job search through this communication lens that we'll be discussing. Now, as some of you may remember, uh, the focus for last session, which was part one, was defining some terms and ideas to really get started thinking about the big picture of what it means to be, quote unquote, an effective communicator. And we're gonna start off today by doing a quick review of some key points uh, that are related to that discussion, both as I mentioned as a refresher and to help set the stage for anyone who couldn't join us in August. So communicating is something most of us do every day to one degree or another. So from that perspective, it's probably fair to say that everyone here already has some degree uh, in expertise in communication. However, even with that practical experiential expertise, there's always room to grow and to learn how to be a more effective communicator, particularly because it's so common to experience challenges to communicating well. And unfortunately, it's not always easy to, it's not always easy or intuitive uh, to know really how to navigate them. So starting off with the question, what is communication? One definition is that it is a process through which information, ideas, and or emotions are shared between two or more people. And it can occur in a number of ways. It can happen through audible communications, which is spoken words, uh, may also involve sounds that are not words, such as nonverbal sounds like grunting or sighing, etc. But of course, not all communications are received through our ears. They may be written out or be shared through body language, uh, sign language. Um, our body can really convey information or clues about what we're thinking and feeling. So it's important to be mindful of that as well. And it's important to note that sometimes our communications happen in ways that are thought out and deliberate, but that's not always the case. Sometimes we end up sharing ideas or information based on a spur of the moment decision or an impulse, and sometimes details get shared with others subconsciously without us even knowing that we're doing it. Like when we're nervous and our hands start shaking or we start tapping our foot repeatedly. Those are things that are we're definitely not aware of doing most of the time, but uh, other people might notice them. Now on this slide, you can see a list of some core elements of effective communication, including that effective communication is a two-way street. 
and it involves both sharing our thoughts and ideas while also investing energy in receiving and absorbing the ideas that are being shared by whoever, whoever else we're communicating with. See, communication can be hard. This means not only being mindful to get across our own perspective in a way that is clear and organized, but also really paying attention to what that other person is trying to get across to us as well, and considering what they're bringing to the table in terms of their own perspective. Communicating effectively may also involve asking clarifying questions if you're not entirely sure what the other person or people you're communicating with are trying to get across to you. It's much better to make sure that everyone's on the same page up front rather than wishing later that you'd ironed out details beforehand. Expressing gratitude when it's appropriate is also a best practice. While you might assume the person you're communicating with knows you're appreciative, the reality is that usually people don't know what we don't tell them directly. And so simply saying thank you can go a very long way in communicating effectively. Another best practice can be summarizing what was discussed at the end of a conversation, either verbally before you walk away from that conversation or written in an email that gets sent around after the fact. And this is really because effective communication isn't necessarily limited to being a one-time event. It should be something that happens regularly so that people remain on the same page as things evolve. Sometimes that's a 10 minute check-in. Maybe it's a weekly meeting of an hour or more. There's really no one right way to do it, but the key is that the conversation is ongoing. In fact, sometimes effective communication very purposefully takes place over more than one conversation. Additionally, effective communication incorporates emotional regulation, which means having the goal of staying centered so that what you're feeling doesn't play too much of a role in how you're expressing yourself. Which is not to say we want to leave all emotions out of work conversations. We're all human, and emotions are one way that we show our humanity, and that can be an important piece to weave in. But sharp words or intense energy can really land differently with your coworkers than it does with your friends and family who may give you a little bit more leeway. And it can sometimes have long-term consequences that are hard or even impossible to move on from. Asking for help when you need it is also an essential part of communicating effectively. Every single person on this planet, no matter their health status or their job title or really any other personal characteristic, is going to need help from time to time. So asking for it shouldn't be something that you shy away from, particularly at work. And of course, effective communications should result in a clear understanding of any next steps. What should happen now as a result of the fact that you had that chat? This, this point can be particularly key in conversations with your healthcare team, which is something many, if not all of you probably already know quite well. It can also often help to prepare in advance for some of those conversations to really make sure that you remember to ask all of the questions you want to in what is often pretty limited time. Similarly, some conversations with family or other loved ones may benefit from advanced preparation, such as if you're sharing news about your diagnosis or updates to your treatment plan. And then these bottom two bullets really start to ground us into the conversation that we're going to be having today. It can be really, really important to think strategically about what you post online, whether that's on social media or on a blog or anywhere else you might be posting, since our online behaviors can have a real impact on our, on our work lives. And there's gonna be a lot more to come on that. And of course, it probably goes entirely without saying at this point that strategic communications can make a big difference in a work-related context, whether you are currently employed or if you are looking for a new opportunity or, or both. So now that we've reviewed some of the critical components of our last session, we're gonna start digging into the topic of social media. And as we do, I do wanna take a moment to talk about some of the good things that social media brings to our lives. Now we hear so much in media today about the dangers of social media, which are very real. And if you've attended any other cancer and careers events, you've most likely heard us talk about some of the complexities that it can create in the work arena. And I'll be discussing those a little bit more today as well. 
But I think it's also really important that we acknowledge some of the benefits because those are very real too. And there wouldn't be a need to talk about the potential complexities if so many of us weren't so drawn to these benefits. In particular, we hear so frequently from people who have received a cancer diagnosis that social media has been really helpful in decreasing their feelings of isolation during and or after treatment. Not only does it allow us to connect with our existing friends and family, and maybe you even use it as a way to easily provide your loved ones with updates, but it's a channel for making new connections with others who are living through a similar experience. Receiving support from a person able to relate firsthand to what you're going through can be tremendously important, as can providing that support to someone else. Having that specific kind of community is often quite powerful. Social media can also be a very efficient tool for creating a curated feed of information, perhaps related to your experience with cancer, by following multiple support organizations in the cancer community and reliable health news resources. Um, these are great ways to have current research. Or perhaps information about grant programs or educational webinars like this one, essentially delivered directly to you. It uh, can be a real time saver. Now, shifting to the work perspective, online communications are important in that it can be a source for prospective job opportunities. You'll see that we have a stat pulled here from an article that one in five employers won't call someone for an interview if they can't find them online. So it's wise to have a strategically created online presence. Uh, but beyond that, it's also the case that many recruiters nowadays will reach out to potential candidates that they find on LinkedIn. Communicating through online platforms might actually bring opportunities to you. Um, the same uh, survey from Harris Poll also found that 78% of current employers believe that their employees should maintain an appropriate social media profile. And this was across a variety of industries from retail to healthcare and beyond. Engaging in communications on social media is also a way to stay relevant in the world of workers. More and more social media and other means of communicating online are becoming part of the way jobs are done. So yes, if you're looking for a new job, staying relevant is key, but also continuing to invest in understanding the online landscape if you've been at your job, your existing job for ages, can be really important as both you and the organization may evolve. So of course, we've talked about some of the potential benefits of online communications, but in order to really understand online privacy, having a visual representation of the money associated with social media can be really eye-opening. Now, the statistic on this slide shows the revenue of Meta, who owns Facebook, from 2009 to 2023 by segment. The social network's advertising revenue in 2023 amounted to $134 billion, which is a 59% increase from 84.2 billion US dollars in 2020. And so the reason for this increase is that in order to keep making money, it's important for Meta to keep making new deals with advertisers. And at the center of those is data about people who are using Facebook and Instagram and so on. So this means the rules for how they're handling that data are ever changing, making it hard to know for sure how their privacy policies are changing day to day. There are some alternative options for social media that tend to provide a little bit more privacy and serve a primary purpose of acting as a safer platform for sharing information about your diagnosis and your treatment. Now, My Lifeline and CaringBridge are two great sites. Um, you're able to opt in to much higher levels of privacy, and you can also have greater control over who you want to be a part of your community. But still, it's really important to think before you share posts from these sites on other social media. But really, in general, reviewing privacy policies for any website where you're sharing personal information is really important. And there's also a very effective step that you can take to protect your privacy you now before ever even sitting down at a keyboard or opening an app. And that is to develop a personal disclosure plan. So this includes making clear decisions about what, if any, information about your cancer experience you're going to be sharing online and off. And when we think about the virtual world, where are you going to share this in terms of specific websites or blogs? And as you're thinking through what's going to work best for you, it's a really good idea to spend some time considering the potential long-term impact of online disclosure. 
it may be the case that some of you on this call have already disclosed at work and everyone's being really supportive and that is an outstanding situation to be in. But the fact is that the internet does not go away. So it's important to think beyond right now and consider possible impacts months and maybe even years down the road, even if at the moment you are in that outstanding situation. Because the truth is none of us can predict the future. So you may find yourself unexpectedly looking for a job five years from now, or your supportive manager may move on and be replaced by someone who starts to Google their new staff. And there's really no way to know how that person's going to respond to the information that they may find. Then once you've made these decisions, communicate them with the people in your network, whether they're friends and family or people that you've connected to online. And even after you've shared those preferences, it's still a good idea to monitor what others are posting about you so that you have a sense of what's out there. Finally, it's key to remember that even if you've passed the mo moment of initial considerations, you can redefine your disclosure and communication plan and preferences at any time. And while it might not change what's already out there, there can still be value in making new, different choices. Now, if thinking about how exactly to go about building up your professional brand online feels intimidating to you, you are not alone. I'm sure you are among friends on this call, but it can help to think about what about doing so as an opportunity to tell the story about who you are as a working person. And that's by taking a strategic approach to posting that allows you to be in control of your information. So that starts by taking a look at what's already out there by Googling yourself. What comes up and also in what order does it come up? If your goal is to put your best self forward for potential employers, does that work for you? If not, what might work better? Those popular social media sites can be deployed strategically to change how you show up in web searches. But you might also consider setting up a professional web page or blog so that there's a dedicated online destination that talks about who you are. We also recommend running each post through a filter by asking yourself questions like the ones you can see in the gray box. Because you can delete posts that are no longer representative of your interests but you want to keep in mind that they'll still be out there somewhere, even though they might be harder to find. Now, to flip that coin, let's talk a little bit about the various mainstream social media platforms and how to post on them strategically as you do figure out how you're going to build out your online brand. Now, social media sites like LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, I can't get used to the new X, and Facebook rank very high in Google searches. So, Becoming active on these sites and presenting a voice that represents who you are as a professional is a really excellent way to elevate your brand. That said, keep in mind that different platforms have different audiences. LinkedIn is considered a secondary resume to many employers, so you'll want to keep it up to date. So for example, if you got a new certification or wrote a blog related to your field that you're particularly proud of, or maybe you got promoted those are all the types of things that you'll want to share on LinkedIn, but the key is to keep it work focused. It's not the place to post about the awesome book you just read, unless maybe you work in publishing. Um, and linked at the bottom of this slide is CAC's archived webinar on building an effective LinkedIn profile, which you may also want to check out as it kind of provides uh, more step-by-step -step processes for a LinkedIn profile. Now, X or Twitter is another platform that can be deployed strategically uh, in order to give employers a curated view of your professional self. And that's by sharing interesting articles you've read or reading, re retweeting thought leaders who you admire and providing commentary through your professional lens. Now, Facebook, on the other hand, is not typically the platform where employers go uh, in order to dig into who you are as a professional. Uh, they might look to see who you are on a personal level, um, but there is more flexibility to post about your personal interests on there. It is worth noting, though, that employers might be looking at your Facebook <clears throat> um, to see what you're posting and how, how you're expressing yourself on there. So really trying to steer clear of rude comments or profanity is an important aspect as they might not land so well with someone who doesn't know you. It might not land well with people who do know you either. So just being mindful of uh, your online presence and the way that you conduct yourself in, in some of these communities is really important. 
So let's shift now to talking about work-related conversations. And what I'm about to say might feel uh, to be on the obvious side, but I do want to quickly mention that whether you're currently employed or looking for a new work opportunity or both, uh, your communications typically are going to fall into one of two categories. There is the spoken, and we would also consider sign language communications to fall into this category. And then there's written. So this slide has some examples of each, and there may be others that could occur to you as well. Now we're gonna spend the rest of this webinar talking about these, but before we do, I just wanna note that there's one key difference that um, I wanna point out, which is that a key piece of communicating effectively in written format is going back to proofread and edit and revise a written message, really to make sure that it's clearly expressing what you want it to. Whereas communicating effectively in spoken format often, not always, but often is accomplished through planning in advance. So some ways to go about doing this include writing out a script or an outline of key points to help drive conversations. This is a pointer that is not only helpful for people experiencing brain fog who want to make sure that they're not leaving out any key points, but there's a strategic benefit as well because it allows you to play with the order that you present topics in, identifying anything that feels redundant and, and so on. It can also help you to think through potential comments, questions, or topics that might come up and could potentially catch you off guard, such as questions about your treatment or how you're feeling. We're going to go through a number of examples of how to plan responses in just a moment. Now, you'll also want to identify and plan to address any boundaries or expectations that you may need to set or manage. Uh, we're going to be doing a webinar on setting boundaries, I think, next month. Um, so certainly uh, registration is still open for that. And it's a really, really uh, uh, informational session that I always learn something new from. Also using friends and families to rehearse work-related conversations before they happen is so, so helpful. I think people often underestimate how helpful role-playing can be or they write it off because it feels silly or makes them feel uncomfortable, which is understandable. But over the years, I've worked with a number of people who have been really surprised by how much of a difference it can make to actually practice making the words come out of your mouth while you're interacting with another person. So to anyone whose reflex is to dismiss this idea out of hand, I just really encourage you to give it a try because saying something for the second, third, fourth time is often much easier than saying it for the first time. So now we start getting into the how-tos of planning responses to comments and questions. And we'll spend the next few slides going through some examples. But first, I do want to just flag that these examples are really directed at people who have disclosed their cancer diagnosis to at least one person in their workplace. However, we know, and as we talked about during that last session, many people make the choice not to disclose because that's what's right for them. So if that's you, I encourage you to keep in mind that the concept here can still be useful even if you haven't disclosed. <clears throat> so here you will find uh, some examples uh, on what the swivel is. And the swivel is a verbal technique or formula that uh, Cancer and Careers has come up with where you acknowledge a cancer-related comment and then swivel the conversation back to something that's more work appropriate and oriented. So for example, if someone says to you, you know, my uncle had cancer, you can respond by saying, I'm really sorry to hear that. It must have been hard. And hey, what did you think about the meeting that we had yesterday? This can be super helpful in being able to control the conversation and the direction that it moves in without having to share any information uh, or details about yourself that you don't want shared. Now, something that I think it's often hard for people to recognize, particularly those who want to be viewed as valuable employees, regardless of their health status, is that everyone, everyone has limits. And it's important to take the time to figure out what yours are and what the triggers for them are, especially while you're juggling both work and cancer treatment and recovery. Now, in our personal lives, it may be easy to tell someone that we need space or to be left alone and even saying that in maybe not the nicest ways. However, work culture often makes that very hard to do, which means that it's critical to find productive ways to communicate your limits. 
Learning to set these boundaries on the job can enable you to decline certain types of requests, like staying late for non-essential tasks or being given new projects to complete. I understand it can be really difficult to say no, um, but figuring out how you can do so can make you a better employee. You won't be overburdened with extra work and you won't be trapped by every ask you receive. And certainly, um, as I mentioned, we do have that upcoming webinar on boundaries. Uh, so I would encourage you to register for that. But if you can't wait, uh, we do have a uh, webinar from last year that is archived on our website. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. Now, the key to setting effective boundaries in the workplace is crafting language that feels natural and communicates this no message in a way that's still professional and team oriented. Now, you'll notice in this example that you'll that they involve expressing gratitude and then sharing an explanation and one that's rooted in being human, which could apply to almost anyone in a workplace. And this is versus giving an explanation, explanation rooted very specifically in a cancer diagnosis. And also flagging that there's sort of a swivel here because the speaker is saying, I can't right now. And then demonstrating a positive character trait, like being conscious of timelines or excitement about future opportunities. And again, role-playing can be helpful here if you're not used to saying no. So I'm sure we have some people who would consider themselves people pleasers in the audience tonight, and it can be really, really, really hard to say no, but I assure you it will make you a stronger employee. Now, there are a whole spectrum of comments that you may encounter in the workplace. The one we have on this slide falls into the category of well-intended but off-putting. So your boss says, you've been looking so exhausted recently, I just didn't want to overwhelm you by adding more to your plate. And you might swivel by saying, I really appreciate your concern, but work is actually a key part of my overall well-being. In fact, last night I had some ideas about the project that I'd love to share with you. Again, the key here is finding language that's relevant to your circumstances and really sounds like you. And I guarantee that the more you practice swiveling, the better you'll get at it and the more naturally it will come. Another area around which we've seen a lot of dialogue in the cancer community is the use of battle language when discussing the experience of going through treatment for cancer. I want to be very explicit in saying that in no way am I implying that using fight metaphors is inherently bad. Um, if it's a concept or language that resonates with and works for you, then we are all for it and fully support it. But we do know that it doesn't work for everyone. And in fact, we've met quite a few survivors over the years who find it very upsetting, which is also valid. And for them, it can be very jarring when someone else assigns that language to their personal cancer experience particularly if it's a coworker that the survivor doesn't know all that well. One of the things that we believe in very strongly at CAC is that each person should be in charge of their own narrative and of how their own story is told. And you probably gathered a little bit of that when we were talking about our online presence. So to that end, how can one address it in the workplace if a coworker says something along the lines of, I so admire how you're battling your cancer. I think that kind of fighting spirit is so critical to defeating it. Again, one approach might be to swivel and say something like, thank you for appreciating how challenging it can be to balance everything I have going on. Hey, while I have you here, uh, the budget recommendations that you provided need to be tweaked slightly. Could we set up a meeting to further discuss? Now this approach drives the conversation back into the realm of work-related topics without having to engage directly with the battle language that was used and your feelings on it. And so while this approach is going to work for some, Others might prefer to take a more direct approach and make it a teachable moment. So in that regard, you might say something like, thank you for appreciating how challenging it can be to balance everything I have going on. I can understand why you think that mindset and attitude are so important to navigating cancer, life, and work. I do wanna share that while for some people, the battle language is very inspiring. For me, it's actually not. So I'd be grateful if we could talk about my experience using less loaded words. Again, this is an approach that's not gonna work for everyone. It's quite direct. Um, and if you do decide to take it, it's important to be open to the idea that it might in fact invite further conversation, which requires you to provide further guidance to your coworker. Or it could create a situation where you leave that person to absorb what you just said. 
And it's also possible you'll get an entirely different response. But the point is that you'll want to be comfortable managing whichever reaction you may generate. <laughs> now, the comment on this slide falls into the category of what we refer to as outright insensitive comments. And you can see the possible response we've included here is pretty substantive. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll leave you to read it on your own. But what this slide really drives home is the idea that it can be useful to sit down and think about how you personally might respond if someone were to make a comment like this so that your reply uses language that sounds like you. And you don't find yourself caught off guard by any emotional reaction you have and subsequently saying something you wish you hadn't. And you know it's totally natural to feel that way and to feel those emotions bubbling up. But like we said, the more you practice and get comfortable with the words coming out of your mouth, the easier it will be to regulate those emotions. Now let's now move towards the communications one is likely to encounter during the job search and why effective communication is so important during this time. So we're going to touch on some critical things today, but I also want to let you know that our West Coast Conference is coming up on October 19th. It'll be virtual, so all can attend, and registration is still open to that. So if there are additional things you would like to learn after this evening, I definitely encourage you all to join us if you're able. But overall, clear communication is absolutely key to opening the door to potential interviews, whether that's through networking or a cover letter or a well-constructed resume or LinkedIn profile. All of these modalities involve making the best use uh, possible of a limited amount of space. Now in interviews as well, you have a limited amount of time to communicate to the interviewer that you are the savviest, most qualified candidate for the job. And this is certainly a skill that requires practice. So. Let's just take a look at some of these things individually. We wanna start with explaining what an effective resume is. So simply put, it's a written communication uh, that's easy to read and understand and keeps a specific audience in mind, meaning that you might use a different version of your resume to apply for different jobs. And if those different jobs may require different skills, <clears throat> it should be a succinct uh, summary also of your capabilities and accomplishments. A few other critical points include that it should be no more than two pages uh, and one page for a recent college grad. Uh, you must have a profile or a summary at the top, should have keywords for scanning software to pick up as uh, many organizations are using um, ATS software, which looks for specific keywords to get you through the, the next round. Putting volunteer and community service on your resume is fine, um, but putting personal information is not. Uh, and keeping in mind that job titles don't really have a universal meaning. So explain your position in terms of responsibility. So for example, if your resume says that you're head of swimming education, what does that actually mean? Are you the only swim instructor at a local YMCA who actually gets in the pool to teach? Or does that mean that you coordinate swimming lessons for five different summer camps or something else? Being specific is really key here. You also want to avoid using phrases such as effective communicator or detail oriented because they're pretty generic. Uh, it's really better to focus on some of those keywords and accomplishments uh, that you would have mentioned throughout. Uh, we do have a ton of job search resources. If anyone's interested, we have some links at the bottom of this slide to our free resume review service and our job search toolkit, which is one of our uh, more popular publications. Now, when it comes to cover letters, uh, I think the two best pieces of advice are don't just regurgitate your resume. Um, this is really your opportunity to use prose to draw parallels or highlight an experience that makes you uniquely suited to the role. And don't use a generic letter that doesn't tie you to the specific company or the job in question. Um, Unfortunately, I have read a lot of cover letters uh, and it can be very clear when someone has submitted a generic cover letter that they've probably also submitted to other potential employers. And unfortunately, I've also seen ones where they forget to replace the current company they're applying to with the one that they sent this to before. So just really being mindful and being careful and really proofing everything you do uh, is really important and certainly speaks to any detail orientation skills and traits that you describe about yourself. Now, 
I mentioned earlier that we do have a full hour long webinar on building an effective profile, LinkedIn profile, but uh, just some key points to go over with you today um, is that it's important to write a compelling description of who you are as a worker so that potential employers or contacts want to keep you reading, want to keep reading, excuse me. You also want to ask for substantive recommendations from people that you're already connected to in your network. Be specific when you reach out to make these requests. For instance, hi, Jane, I'm updating my LinkedIn profile and would love for you to talk about the XYZ project that you and I work to get on together. Um, post status updates regularly so your profile doesn't become stale and start to become an inaccurate representation of who you are. Uh, we also encourage joining groups that are relevant to your professional interests and actively Participating in them is really another way to not only ensure that you're using LinkedIn effectively, but it can be a great way to network and also stay abreast of any uh, positions that may open up that um, are just being announced right on LinkedIn. So this nicely bridges us over to the topic of networking. Now, according to a number of sources, about 85% of jobs are found through networking. And networking can happen both online as well as in person. So knowing how to best approach it in either format is really important. Now, similar to role playing, it's understandable if networking feels awkward or uncomfortable. And it is pretty common for people to feel that way about networking. A great way to ease some of the anxiety going into these interactions is to have some general questions on a variety of topics to get conversation flowing and to better understand who you're speaking with as well as allowing them to get to know you better in the process. So here are just a few ideas to get some of those conversations started. Now, they don't have to solely be focused on professional experience. Learning about hobbies, interests, talents are really all ways to get people more engaged and open and feel connected to you. So as you brainstorm other questions and conversation starters, you want to make sure that you're not coming off as intrusive or overly personal. But the goal is to appear curious and interested in learning about the other person. You know, stick with some basics. Where, do you, where have you been traveling? What, did, what books have you been reading? Things of that nature. Now, here we've included a number of best practices for communicating effectively while networking in person. Um, so first, it's really important to do the best you can to remember people's names. When you're introduced to someone new, it's not always easy to immediately commit their name to memory, but the following tricks can really help with that. So repeating the person's name two or three times or making an association between their name or, or something else. For example, the person's name is Bruce and they're wearing a blue shirt. Perhaps you name them as Blue Shirt Bruce, or maybe it sticks with you because you love Bruce Lee movies. Uh, just make sure that it is something appropriate that you're associating their name with. Small talk is often something that gets a bad reputation, but knowing how to uh, is Im really important because it can help you to initiate or carry a conversation with people when networking in a more natural, gradual way. Um, overall, you wanna try to avoid controversial topics that are heavier, such as politics and religion, though politics can be really hard to avoid. We definitely encourage you to do so. And stick to more approachable topics like the questions that we looked at on the last slide. Now, it's also essential to use proper networking etiquette. So if you spend more than 15 minutes talking to someone, send a follow-up email. And in emails, try to use the word you more than you use the word I. And if you tell them that you're going to do something like send your resume or forward a news article you discussed, you want to really make sure that you do so in a timely manner to ensure that you build on any good first impression that you generated and that that newly formed relationship doesn't become stale. Now, when it comes to online networking, uh, one key difference between Facebook and LinkedIn is that it's much more acceptable to reach out to people that you haven't met yet. So in fact, if you're looking for job opportunities, this is a highly recommended way of networking. Um, that said, if you do reach out to someone that you don't know personally, it's really important to know exactly what you're asking for in reaching out to them. As most people are willing to help, if you're able to articulate exactly what you need from them and to remember that networking is a reciprocal process. So try to work in the offer to help them out in some way in return. And to that end, it makes sense to be strategic about your connections. So reach out to people who it makes sense logically to have as part of your network. That may feel a little strange if you're doing a career change, but maybe 
finding someone who had a job that was similar to your past job or something like that, just so that it's not totally out of the blue. Now, hopefully once you've deployed some strategic networking, you are going to find yourself with some interviews lined up. Now, in terms of best practices for interviews, uh, a key factor to keep in mind is that what's most important to a prospective employer is how the applicant can solve their problems and really meet their needs. So you wanna be sure that you're prepared to speak to that. Tell stories about how you've solved problems at prior jobs and try to use specific examples. Also, don't be afraid to make the exchange conversational. One of the things hiring managers are assessing for is personal fit. So don't shy away from back and forth exchanges. I've mentioned this a number of times, but when I was interviewing for Cancer and Careers, I'm pretty sure that the mutual love of cheese that our executive director and I had really uh, cinched the deal. So if a reviewer asks you a question that you're not quite sure how to answer, you also don't want to be afraid to ask clarifying questions to ensure that you respond with the answer that they're looking for. And also, and this can be absolutely critical, um, and not as many people do it as they should, but you must send a thank you note after every interview to everyone that you met with. Now, if you do a group interview, it can be tempting to send a single email that CCs everyone that you met with. But we encourage you to resist that impulse because sending individual notes recognizes the individual contributions of each interviewer and leaves a very good impression and shows that you are appreciative of the time that each of them took out of the day to meet with you. So here we have a few uh, best practices for communicating effectively during interviews. Um, so you've heard me say about 1 million times so far that preparing beforehand for anything is always a good idea, but particularly before interviews. So researching the company and the interviewer before you meet with them really indicates that you took the time to familiarize yourself, which typically contributes to a good first impression. It's also smart to plan or draft and practice answers to potential questions so that you're able to provide responses that sound polished and comprehensive and you don't have the deer in headlights look that some of us fear we'll have in an interview. Now, it's also important to know that the way that you communicate in an early stage interview may be different to how you communicate once you've already had one or two meetings. So in early stage interviews, remember that your cancer experience may be front and center in your mind, but it's very unlikely to be in the interviewers. Your primary focus in these moments should be describing your interest in the job and selling yourself as qualified and personable and confident. Now, in later stage interviews, you'll want to be strategic about disclosure. If it feels important to do so, and again, this is generally not required, you'll want to feel out the moment where it feels relevant to share this information in the conversation. And then don't be surprised if whomever you're interviewing with doesn't ask you any follow-up questions, because really, employers are for the most part not legally allowed to ask you about your health or health history. And if the person you're chatting with knows this, they're probably going to move on to a new topic pretty quickly. You'll also want to be strategic about when you ask about benefits like health insurance and time off, because asking about those too soon can often make you look like you're more focused on the extras that might come with the job rather than doing the job itself. So just really being mindful of what you're conveying with the questions that you're asking back. Now, when interviewing, the swivel can be a very useful tool as well. Um, so if a question comes up that's either related to your cancer or for some reason, that you'd pre prefer not to spend a lot of time unpacking, you wanna simply refocus the conversation so that you're able to put the recruiter or interviewer back at ease and really write the, the conversation back to where you want it to be. Now, the key is to be future focused, non-specific and brief. Now it's important to answer the question um, and acknowledge uh, the question at hand and then really swivel that interviewer's attention back to the job in question your desire to get hired and of course the skill set that's on the table. Um, in the interest of time I'm I'm going to not read these but uh, you guys will all have the slides for this evening so you can take a look at these. Uh, and again these are just a few more examples of how to really implement the swivel in, um, in an interview scenario. So here are just a few of our uh, communication tools and resources. Uh, we do have a guide to LinkedIn, which can be extremely helpful. As I mentioned, we have uh, an archive CAC webinar on LinkedIn profiles. 
Um, also really important is an online reputation management. So that can be really helpful in terms of really some of the steps that you can take to figure out how to best convey your cancer experience. Um, and of course, building and protecting your online brand, which we've, uh, we've gone over tonight, is really, really important in terms of uh, your use of social media. Um, I do also want to mention that uh, putting your uh, LinkedIn profile linked on your resume can be really helpful too. Uh, since resumes do tend to be pretty short, you can add a little bit more color and context on your resume on your LinkedIn profile that you might not have been able to do on your um, on your resume. And here's a couple more communication tools and resources for when you are on the job. So um, we have a whole section on sharing the news because disclosure is such a an enormous piece to uh, navigating work in cancer. Um, you know, the who, how, when to share is really, uh, are all really important decisions that, that need to be made that can cause a lot of stress and anxiety. So we break it down so that hopefully it helps you to feel a little bit more confident in the process. Um, also much more about addressing comments from work, um, both the well-intended and the not so well-intended, um, and of course, setting professional boundaries, which is so incredibly important in order to have that control <laughs> in the workplace. And of course, here's some more. Um, and our interview cheat sheet is extremely helpful. Um, it involves that role playing that I have touted so much this evening, um, but it can be really, really helpful just to uh, bounce some ideas, some answers, get a read of what other people think your answers sound like, if it sounds like you are confident, et cetera. Just super helpful. So really the top takeaways for today are that online communication considerations are really important. Um, also understanding techniques to approach conversations that can help to remain in control. Uh, you know, with a cancer diagnosis so frequently, there is a major feeling of a loss of control. So your ability to even just control something like a conversation can feel really empowering and give you the confidence that you may be lacking in that moment. And also many aspects of the job search require effective communication in both spoken and written formats. So being prepared and being knowledgeable about what those might be is um, really helpful. So I'm gonna invite Rachel back on up here um, to tell you a little bit about what we have coming up and we'll have some time for questions as well. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. Another incredibly informative presentation as always. So if you have any follow-up questions, Nicole's email is on this slide, or you can email cancerandcareers at cew.org. Uh, we hope to connect with you on social media, and all of our handles are listed here, as well as links to sign up for our bi-monthly newsletter and visit our website. I do want to also say that you can send us messages on Facebook or Instagram if you do not want to post, given yes. our discussion on uh, the connections between who we follow and who we communicate with online. Absolutely. A very important point. So before we move on to Q&A, uh, I do want to mention some great webinars we still have coming this year. Next month, we are welcoming back Ellie Schaefer, who will be leading a session on setting boundaries that is coming up on October 9th. Nicole had mentioned this session earlier. It's always a popular one. Then in November, Nicole will be back with us to talk about balancing work and caregiving. And finally, in December, we are finishing the year with self-care, practical approaches at work and beyond. And you can find more information about each webinar on our website, where you can also register for all of the upcoming sessions if you haven't already. We also have a series of webinars coming up for our Spanish-speaking community. The first webinar is in two weeks and will be balancing work in cancer. Then in October, we are going to have an Ask the Expert conversation with oncologist Victoria Blinder. And finally, on November 5th, we have another Ask the Experts conversation, this time with psychiatrist Neves Cuervo. So if you speak Spanish or know someone who does, we would love to see you or them there. 
And if you could help us spread the word to any Spanish speakers in your community, we would appreciate that as well. Once again, there's information on our website that's linked here, and you can also register for free. And then finally, our West Coast Conference is coming up on Saturday, October 19th. This is an all-day event taking place on Zoom, and we've got a really great lineup of speakers and topics, so would love to see you there as well. Once again, registration is free and can be found at the link on this slide. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, here are CE requirements again. Uh, I will leave this up here while we move on to the Q&A and let me take a look at what we have in the Q&A box. Okay, so um, first question we have here, someone says, uh, I have just returned to work after a couple of months away while I underwent treatment. I can barely get through my work because people keep stopping by to check in on how I'm feeling. I understand this is really well-intentioned and I appreciate everyone's concern and care for me, but how do I politely tell them that I don't want to keep answering that same question? Yes, uh, sometimes people's well-intentions are not wanted. Uh, so I think totally understandable. Uh, you know, you want to get back to some sort of normalcy, some sort of process where you can perhaps not be thinking about your cancer since you're at work. Um, so you can either respond to some of them and say, you know, I'm, I'm great. I'll definitely keep you updated if anything changes. Uh, another thing that could be helpful is uh, having a point person. So um, maybe you have a coworker who you're a little bit closer with, who you could maybe ask to send the message that uh, any updates can be found through them uh, so that you don't have to keep dealing with it and having the same conversations over and over again. Um, you know, it's really important to remember that it's not your responsibility to share your information and to have any explanations for anybody, even if they are well-intended and they want to know about you. Um, it's not your responsibility to, to share personal information. Um, if someone were going through something else, uh, let's say a divorce, you're not necessarily going to go in and check on them every day either. And they might not want to tell you anything. So same goes really just personal information in the workplace is a totally personal decision on what gets shared, if anything. Um, and so just kind of coming up with some ideas for how to address, address the challenges can be helpful. So this could be something that, you know, you take a weekend to just really think about how you would how you would frame it to them. Yeah, those are all really good points, Nicole. And I think that another thing that it's important to keep in mind uh, as well, and again, I, I, I don't know if this is the case with the person who posed this question, but we do often hear from people who had been very open at one point, perhaps early on in what was going on in their experience, and then decided that they, you know, we got to a point where they didn't want to be sharing as much or there were particular aspects of what was happening that they didn't feel like coming up talking about but the fact that they had been so open early on led to and like a sort of a feeling of obligation that they needed to keep being that open and so right. i think a really important thing to remember as well is that you can always make a different decision and that is a valid a valid thing to do. If you wanted to be open and now you don't want to be open, you can undo that and that is okay and feel you are validated and standing by that and, um, and you know, communicating that feeling as well. You know, it might mm -hmm. be, there might be a moment where you say, you know, I appreciate that, you know, that I know we did a lot of talking about this at one point, but, you know, at this point, I rather focus on other things and people will usually take a gentle instruction on that as well. For sure. So um, I think we have one more time for one more question. So apologies to those of you who are not going to be able to get to. Um, I have been out of work for a while. I have gone through treatment and I'm starting to feel like it might be time to start looking for another job. However, my energy levels are still low and the thought of networking makes me tired just thinking about it. Is it really necessary? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is, is that it 
doesn't have to be as energy and time consuming um, as you might be making it out to be, especially since so much of it can be done virtually now. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go to some networking happy hour with a name tag on. You can perhaps do it from your couch. Um, spending the time to go through other people's profiles on LinkedIn is really helpful. Doing some due diligence research uh, in order to find the appropriate people to speak with and just having maybe an informational phone call uh, can, can be uh, an option as well. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we do have quite a bit of information on networking on our website that can give you good ideas, but really also remembering that networking doesn't have to be such a formal process. You could network with uh, people at your church. You could network at your doctor's office. You could network at your support groups. Um, really, anyone can be a source of uh, potential networking opportunities, uh, even if they don't work in the industry you're looking for, maybe their cousin does, their son or daughter does, you know, it's really, it's, it's pretty open and the process isn't set in stone into how you have to go about it, but really just putting, putting the word out and feelers out can have tremendous impact. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be in such a professional setting all the time. Absolutely. I think that is such a key piece of it um, to keep in mind that when you are networking, you are just showing up as yourself and mm -hmm. it can absolutely feel like clearing a huge mental hurdle to take that first step towards networking. But I think a lot of people also um, often find once they clear that first hurdle and have a few conversations, mm -hmm. they realize um, it was it's not as daunting as they were maybe thinking that it might be in their head before they actually took the first step to do that. So um, we have a lot more information about networking available at Cancer and Careers. If you would like more details, please feel free to reach out to us. But uh, in the meantime, I think we're going to leave tonight's event right here. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, once more, if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to, we apologize. Please do email them to us at cancerandcareers at cew.org. And uh, we thank you for being here. Have a great night. Thanks so much. Good night.